This is episode 626 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I'm very pleased to be joined for this episode by Steve Jones. He won uh, the Republican primary for District 1 in Congress here in New Mexico. And uh, welcome to Tipping Point New Mexico, Steve. Paul, it is my great pleasure. And I'm quite humbled, I might say, by the fact that I'm sitting here with you because as I shared with you on the phone when you invited me, I've been following you for a number of years. I love the concept of your foundation and what you're trying to achieve in New Mexico. And certainly a think tank to solve our problems in New Mexico that you are at the heart of is critically needed. Well, that is very kind of you, and I appreciate it. And uh, I wish I could say that I knew who you were up until the uh, primary election, uh, <laughs> but I did not. And I figured this would be a great opportunity for me to get to know you, for constituents around District 1 to get to know you, and of course, folks across the state and even the nation to find out more about Steve Jones and uh, your attempt to run for District 1 against Melanie Stansbury. So uh, let's begin. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, Steve. All right. Let, let's start uh, at the beginning, which is always a good place. Actually, I uh, was a um, high school graduate from Fermian High School in Odessa, but well before that, I grew up in the south side of Odessa. And if any of you have ever been in oil patch country, you know there's some pretty tough people there. Too tough for me, honestly, because I decided I was going to get a college degree. And so I left there and went to the University of Houston where I worked my way through college. I got a bachelor and master's degree. And I emphasize I worked my way through to uh, emphasize the difference between what Biden did with forgiving the debt of old students who borrowed money and then became majors in music or whatever other issues that were not as well paying. So I did my degrees there. I found out at uh, the point that I was going to graduate, and that was May 29th, that I was drafted uh, under the lottery system by the Selective Service Board at that time. And I was in Fort Ord, California, on the day that I was supposed to receive my diploma after all those years of hard work, literally. So I joined the military, reluctantly. I, uh, my father had been a conscientious objector in World War II and served in the Philippines as a cook. I was also a conscientious objector on religious grounds. My family have always been Lutheran, hundreds of years in the past, literally, in Ringabu, Norway. And as a result of my religious convictions, I filed as a conscientious objector as well with the Selective Service Board, which didn't make them particularly happy with me, but I did serve. They made me a medic, and uh, I rose rapidly through the ranks because of my uh, work ethic, you might say. And so I became a staff sergeant, and I'm proud to say I received the Soldier's Medal for heroism. Wow, that is quite a story. So uh, thank you for sharing that. That's a great part of your background, uh, somebody who uh, had objections on religious grounds to, uh, you, you didn't say it, but I presume the Vietnam War. Yes, uh, and, yes. uh, uh, you know, were still dedicated and gave your all to the role that you ultimately played and uh, did a great job with that. So uh, currently, well, up until recently, we shall say, uh, you lived in Rio Doso. Uh, you were affected by the fires. Can you share a little bit about, before we get into the nitty gritty of your, your ideas and issues you're going to be running on, uh, obviously Rio Doso has been devastated in this recent round of fires. Some they say were started by lightning. Some look like arson, but um, just share a little bit about what you experienced there uh, for our listeners. The tragedy that's befalling, and I will say continuing in Rui Doso is in a way it's a tribute to the unity of New Mexicans. Uh, there has been just a groundswell of support throughout the state for what's happened in Ridoso. And so from those in Ridoso Village to you, I express my deepest heartfelt gratitude for your help. 
Many brave people came to help fight the fires, first responders. It was a tragedy and is ongoing as a tragedy, but it's happened before in New Mexico. And we've always responded very positively. Now, as to my own personal situation, which I, I, I feel a little bit uh, reluctant to get into, but, but my house was spared, but many were not. In the congregation, uh, Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran that I go to, we had five members of our congregation lost everything, and seven of the firemen who we are closely affiliated with lost their homes while they were fighting the fire. So there's just unbelievable amount of loss, and it continues, as you see in the news reports nightly. Every time it rains an inch or two, our main streets and all of the canyons turn into rivers, and uh, even more homes are destroyed. I think there's been like 500 additional homes destroyed after the fire. So it, it is uh, a tribute to the New Mexico that uh, we've been supported as we have, but we're not through. Do you think Rio Doso can recover? Um, it's obviously uh, never going to be quite the same. Uh, and I personally have always enjoyed my time in Rio Doso. It's a beautiful area, of course. If uh, uh, folks haven't been down there, um, you know they've missed out. And unfortunately, uh, there's going to be some big, big changes, I'm sure. But uh, uh, what, what's your kind of prognostication of what the future of Rio Doso holds? Uh, about a week ago... I called the mayor, who's, uh, uh, um, I won't say a good friend, but an acquaintance, and I asked him basically the same question. And what his response was that he said, Steve, I think it's going to be at least a seven-year project mm -hmm. uh, to put the infrastructure back in place. As an example, uh, we have a company that provides Internet service, which simultaneously provides our cell coverage. All of their facilities were destroyed by fire. Yes, we can get some modest internet and cell phone coverage here, but it's because of a, a Herculean effort by others who wanted to supply the firefighters, the first responders, with a method of communicating to the outside world. So the infrastructure is going to be a seven-year project. The homes, let's put it this way, a fire seven eight years ago that occurred in one of our canyons has never been brought back up to speed because we are a beautiful village high in the mountains with remote uh, access to supplies and a lot of contractors. So whenever the, the project of building out the infrastructure happens, you're going to see a lot of uh, fire-scarred trees. You're going to see a lot of water damage for years to come, sadly. All right. Well, um, let's talk about your campaign for Congress. And uh, I guess I'll start off with uh, why Why now? Why choose to run for Congress and make your foray? Uh, I, I don't know. Have you ever been in politics before? Is this the first time running for office? Paul, it's uh, not my first. Not your first. Okay. Not my first. In 2020, I entered the race in Congressional District 2, and you referred to the size and shape of District mm -hmm. 1. Good old Jerry Mander. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Jerry Mander put Riodoso, took Riodoso from Congressional District 2 into 1. Mm -hmm. But in the earlier view of uh, Riodoso's village, we were in Congressional District 2, and I was incensed by two things. One, Biden was going to be running for president. I have not mentioned after my military service, I spent the rest of my career in the energy industry. Mm -hmm. And all of us in the energy industry feared what has ultimately happened, and that is Biden's decidedly negative attitude toward the energy industry. So I was very much interested in doing whatever I could to keep him from getting elected. And then secondarily, a good Republican candidate, Yvette Hurrell, in Congressional District 2, was beaten in an earlier election by Social Till Torres Small. Now, Social Till Torres Small got there by doing two things which incensed me. One, she lied to her own Democrat base about her position, and then she lied to the Republicans. And so basically both sides got only 
a um, distorted view of who she really was. So when she stood for re-election in 2020, I decided to get in not to run against uh, Yvette Harrell, not to win the race, but solely to expose all of her lies and hopefully uh, get her out of office. So I ran, it's called a stalking horse campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, For those of you who are into, uh, let's say, the practical politics, what I wanted to do was simply get in the way of Torres Mall. And I did that effectively. My wife likes to point to the the victory margin that Yvette Garrett Harold uh, received in that race and say, that was me. No, it <laughs> a part of it was yes, but I was very pleased to say, one, that uh, Toria Small, not only did she get defeated, but she left the state. And uh, sadly... Biden did prevail, of course. That was uh, the the sad aspect of it. But I felt that that foray was worth the time and the money that my wife and I spent. Well, now you are in District 1. Uh, that is Melanie Stansbury. And I will uh, go out on a, uh, not a limb, but a small branch and say uh, she is one of the most very radical members of the Democratic Party. She's uh, uh, right there alongside uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, the various other members of the squad. Um, her social media account is, uh, especially X or Twitter, is, is uh, an abomination in terms of the, what she states and the way she uh, talks uh, and her press conferences and her uh, various other videos and, and whatever she puts out there. So I I think I can grasp why you might run, but uh, talk a little bit about her and your views of Melanie Stansbury, as well as how you might do things just a, just a wee bit differently if you were elected in uh, that district. I spoke of my admiration for the Rio Grande Foundation. And the reason that it is uh, an organization that I have such great regard for is that the organization focuses on solutions for the problems of New Mexico. And in looking at New Mexico, we can see, of course, it's obvious to everyone that we're on the bottom of a lot of lists of states for various issues. And in order in order to um, let's say, improve the condition for New Mexicans. And that's the per capita income, GDP, uh, the crime rate, et cetera. All of those things, it is necessary to focus on solutions and not people. And so I almost give no thought uh, to Melanie Stansbury. It's not about her as a person, but it is about coming up with practical solutions. I spent my career solving problems around the world. And always the way to solve a problem is to get at a higher level and look down upon the whole scenery, the whole topography, and say, how do we go about getting out of the muck? If you're staying in the muck, if you're (laughs) in Trump's words, if you're in the middle of the swamp, it's kind of hard to remember that your job is to fight alligators. So I'm, I'm really looking at this run in Congressional District 1 as a uh, an attempt to solve New Mexico's problems. And there's a lot of practical solutions. Think tanks, I am a big advocate for it. I think a bipartisan approach to looking at all of our problems, putting aside hyper-partisan politics with the idea that we're going to come up with solutions. And by the way, the question is, for me anyway, how can you solve, say you are a progressive in the state of New Mexico, if there's no progress. It's one thing to say, look at all that we've achieved, but it's quite another to say, you know, we haven't done much, but you need to return us to office because of those awful people on the other side of the aisle. So that's the kind of hyper-partisanship that keeps us in the the country-wise and state-wise with no problems. We can't possibly solve problems if all that we're doing is fighting. So, Paul, to answer your question, I got in this race not to demonize Melanie Stansberry, and I agree with you. If you read her social accounts, you kind of wonder where she's coming from. I, I, 
I think of her as a little bit like uh, the old farm system. They used to have a a uh, wind vane that was a cock. It was basically, it was a chicken. Mm-hmm. And it swiveled in the sky above the house, basically to show the farmers which way the wind was blowing. Well, that chicken on mm-hmm. the top of the, the barn is Melanie Stansberry. She basically points wherever the wind blows. My own approach is to have foundations, foundations that used that you use as guides to how to go about solving problems. I would guess, and I'm going to for sure be able to determine this, that 100% of Melanie Stansberry's votes have been strictly on party lines. Well, we could save ourselves $170,000 simply by mailing in her uh, votes from the state of New Mexico, say, hey, we know she's going to vote straight Democrat on all these issues, so can you give us the money back and not bother sending her up? Well, I would make the case that Stansbury doesn't just vote Democrat. She is on the vanguard, I use that term advisedly, of the far, far left wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, She acts like she is, um, again, with AOC and other members of the squad. So her efforts are not just voting with Democrats, but to drag the Democratic Party uh, further and further to the left. Um, Just going through a few recent tweets, uh, she talks about immigration. Um, She does not seem to have any views uh, that she's willing to publicize about illegal immigration. Uh, She complains about Project 2025, which I'm sure she's never really uh, looked at in any detail. Uh, She talks about uh, student loan forgiveness and uh, the fact that the president has done that and repeatedly done that, uh, regardless of what the Supreme Court has said about it and uh, their rulings about it. She's also uh, joined efforts and introduced legislation to, uh, as she calls it, uh, reform the Supreme Court, but ultimately she wants to... uh, she basically uh, would do anything she could to uh, eliminate the conservative majority on the court and mold the court back into a another left wing uh, branch of government. Um, so I know those are things that she uh, wants, and you want other things. So uh, you know, on your website, you've got three very uh, kind of basic things that you talk about. Uh, your issues are strengthen the economy, strong borders, and protect the Second Amendment. Um, I, I'm sure she would say that she wants to strengthen the economy, but I, I think you have some very significant differences. Uh, and then strong borders and protect the Second Amendment. I think it's safe to say you guys just flat out disagree on those policies. So uh, talk a little bit about each of them, though, and uh, what you'd like to see happen in Washington uh, if you were elected. If I could, for a moment, go back a few years with you, Paul. There are many things about uh, Melanie Stansberry that will stick in the mind of anyone who cares about uh, law and order and New Mexico. She and uh, Deb Holland, at the time, were espousing that Congress adopt defunding police, and I would expand that because she didn't restrict it just to police. She said all uniformed services, which would have been Border Patrol, which would have been Highway Patrol, would would have been police, would have been U.S. Marshal, basically to defund them as a part of the Brief Act. And she actually was in writing telling Congress, please pass this bill. Now, I don't know if she still believes that nonsense or not. It's obviously uh, a far left viewpoint. Uh, anyone again who th- who lives in Albuquerque certainly doesn't want the streets to be controlled by criminals and values uh, the men and women of uniform that are here. In now, there are other issues like that. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, her quotes about the border. Actually, she was in a subcommittee meeting, and I don't believe it's been that long. It could have been February, maybe March of this year in which she interrupted the people talking about the dire situation at the border. And I will get fairly close into what I paraphrase as to what she said. She said, you know, the other side of the aisle thinks there's a big problem at the border. I agree with them, but it's not what they think. 
The big problem is all of these poor people who are coming to the border, they need all kinds of social programs. Their children are sick. They need to get uh, education. We need to give them health care. We need. And so she went on to list all of the basic social programs that the United States offers its citizens. And she was espousing that those be immediately available to anyone who presented themselves at the border. Well, one of my Republican colleagues challenged her on that and said, are you telling me that you think that's the solution to these people? What about where they come from? She says, you're right. You're right. I forgot about that. We need to send money to the countries that these poor people come from so that there will be less need for them to move here to receive the benefits. So in essence, what she was espousing is giving the dictatorship and, and corrupt regimes of, of Central America and some in South America, certainly some nutcases in Venezuela, but all of those countries, what she wanted to do was basically make social programming available to those countries in order to stem the flow into the United States. So Porter uh, is an issue with her. And again, that was in February, so it's a very recent. She's probably changed to fall in line with the recent awakening, if you will, of the Democrats on this issue to try to stem the flow. But once you put out the welcome mat and people are in transit to come to your border, it's kind of hard to stem the flow. Now, uh, your statement is, uh, is uh, you know, reasonably long. It's fairly detailed. It includes, obviously, uh, talk of uh, various ways to stem the tide of people coming here illegally. Uh, what is kind of your broader vision? If if uh, just if you were president of the United States or something, taking you up a, a few notches, what kind of immigration policy do you think uh, is worthy of the United States? Uh, you know, do you see the need for more labor? Do you need more vetting? Uh, more of a legal process that works? Uh, is it mostly about security and securing the border? Is there an ordered process there? Kind of lay out a, a brief vision for immigration into uh, the United States. Let me start with a very simple statement. Trump was right. Mexico is the key. All of the people flowing across our southern border have one thing in common, and that is that the, many of them have come either from Mexico or they've come from uh, the, the southern border of Mexico and crossed the whole length of the country. When I was in Mexico in an immigration office getting a visa, my wife and I were there, and we were turned away. They had uh, basically told us, normally we would be able to help you, but... Uh, we've got so many people we're processing. And there were 500 people there. And I looked around, and uh, there were certainly not Hispanics there as well. There were many different nationalities. And there were Middle Easterners. There were Africans. There were Europeans and certainly Hispanics. But they were in that process. And I asked the immigration officer, I said, "What? what is this? And they said, well, we're interdicting. Trump has threatened to close the border completely if we don't interdict and keep these people from flowing through our country. And so his pressure on Mexico resulted in a substantial reduction, and it could have gotten down to near zero. So it's a mutual border. The other side of the border should be our partner, our, our neighbor for sure, controlling the access to our southern border. So that's number one. Number two, the immigration offices throughout Mexico say, you know why you have a problem with immigration? And I said, no, I really can't tell you all the reasons. They said, it's simple. You've got laws on your books you're not enforcing. Depending upon who's in power, you go back and forth in terms of relaxing it. Just simply follow the laws on the books and make it a very difficult thing to enter your country illegally. And why have we stopped using the word illegal? It is illegal. If the very first act a person takes, undertakes coming into our country is to break our laws, what do you think their future is going to be like here? They're not going to pay income taxes. They're certainly going to have no regard for driving without uh, licenses or insurance or on and on and on. 
So the picture that we paint for these people coming in is we don't really care about our laws. Come on in and we'll do our best to provide you with all of the benefits, but you don't have any responsibilities. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to the Second Amendment. Um, generally speaking, I think that's a pretty straightforward issue. Uh, you're either for it or against it, and uh, I take it you're for it. So uh, anything you want to elaborate on the Second Amendment? Paul, well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, made reference to the weather vane that Stansberry represents. There are certain things in, in my life that are the rock foundation for all of my beliefs and all of my decisions. And the two most, well, three most prominent is first and foremost, the Bible. As I mentioned, I'm very religious, so I always look uh, at the Bible as to what God is telling us. But secondarily is the founding, are the founding documents. Those founding documents are the single reason our country is as great as it is. The Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, those are rocks that unless and until they are amended, have to be the guiding force for not only me, but our federal government and our state government. Guess what? Second Amendment is probably the most succinct, the clearest aspect of the Constitution. A lot of people struggle with reading the Constitution. Read the Second Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms is very succinct, very straightforward. There's a reason why it's there. And every country who's taken arms away from their citizens has resulted in, sad but true, if you take away guns from the citizens, only outlaws will have guns. And so I'm, I'm a strong supporter, but I've already referenced. I'm the last person you would expect to be uh, supporting the Second Rights Amendments because, number one, I am a conscientious objector. Number two, I've never owned a weapon in my life. Number three, I'm a vegetarian. So I have all of the aspects of somebody who would say, you know, those guys with uh, that want to have weapons uh, are not somebody I can support. And quite the contrary. I support the Second Amendment of the Constitution as a basic right given to us by the founders, and it doesn't have conditions. So back to your point about you're either for it or against it, I'm probably more for it than people who claim to be for it because I don't, I don't believe in exceptions to the Second Amendment. There is, no, there is no crack in the interpretation. There is no, <laughs> there's no interpretation. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, let's uh, spend some time on uh, the third leg that you have in your platform on the issues of strengthening the economy. That's obviously my bailiwick and uh, something that I care uh, deeply about. And of course, we focus on New Mexico's economy at the Rio Grande Foundation, but uh, the rising tide lifts all boats. If we have a growing uh, economy and good policies coming out of Washington, we're going to have growth here in New Mexico. And no industry is more critical to New Mexico than the industry that you came out of, of course, the oil and gas industry. We're the second leading producer of oil and gas. A lot of federal lands in New Mexico. Biden, when he took office, said, uh, you know, we're coming after the oil and gas industry. Kamala Harris, the newly minted, uh, newly appointed presidential candidate, has publicly stated that she opposes uh, fracking as a process. Uh, What's your take on oil and gas industry and energy issues more broadly in, uh, uh, in Congress and the federal government? Uh, Paul, I'm going to go back up at a 10,000-foot level with you because there is something even f more important to me. Now, I said I have two degrees in accounting. I'm a CPA. I was a partner <clears throat> with a national CPA firm, and as such, I traveled around to many, many countries. We in the United States have a, an imminent threat, and I'm talking very, very near term, of going broke. Broke. The United States of America can go broke just like any other entity. The way we're going to get there is by the ridiculous spending over and above what our country earns and the debt that we're incurring. I was just listening this morning to a newscast about what's happening to interest rates. Interest rates are going up exorbitantly. So whatever your belief system is about what the United States government should be doing 
it's all going to require money. And the only way that we can save this country is to have sane fiscal policy. Now, that comes under the Constitution, believe it or not. I am a fiscal conservative. Now, that doesn't mean I don't like spending money, which I don't. I'm a CPA. But what it does mean is unless until the Congress uh, is empowered by the Constitution to spend money in a certain way, it should not be. Now, we have a in, uh, intolerable economic policy going on right now. Why would a CPA be concerned with that? Because I can see clearer than most that we have difficulty constraining the expenditures for our country. We need a budget. We need people who are anticipating that we're going to hand off a country that is bankrupt to children and grandchildren. So that, to me, is number one. Now, as it relates to energy, we are on the verge of one of the greatest evolutions probably in the last 200 years. That's artificial intelligence. Whether you're for it or against it, it's coming and it will be here. The people who are intimately involved with artificial intelligence will tell you in the next five years, we're going to double our need for energy or we're going to advocate our position to the Chinese or the Russians or whoever else. That's intolerable. We've got to keep the lead in artificial intelligence. Well, guess what? That is going to double the electricity. And if that is happening, tell me which of the energy sources are we going to be most dependent on? Well, and guess. Well, or, or nuclear. Um, nuclear. I think nuclear may option. be the long-term solution. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm there. And what's interesting, Paul, is that people demonize the energy industry saying that, oh, all they care about is pumping and, and polluting. No, not true at all. The largest hydrogen sequestration or capturing system anywhere is Exxon. Second is Chevron. So they are mindful of all of this. They don't define themselves as oil and gas companies. They define themselves as energy companies. So we are going to be utilizing a lot of energy or go backward and become an agrarian society. That's the two options that we've got. Well, um, I, I guess I'll just ask one question, uh, and maybe it's putting you on the spot a little bit, but uh, something we've talked a lot about at the foundation is liquefied natural gas and exporting that across the globe. You cool it uh, or you send it to the coast, uh, predominantly the Gulf, and you ship it across uh, the globe to Western European nations or Asian countries, and they generally speaking, uh, use that as a replacement for coal. So you get the benefit of CO2 reduction by about 50% or more. You get them being more the other nations like Germany, they switch to American produced natural gas as opposed to Russian. Uh, China, uh, they're hungry for it. They're looking for it in the Middle East. We could be the world's leading source of liquefied natural gas, but Biden put a, uh, a hold on permitting of new facilities, uh, I don't know, six months ago. A judge recently said that that was not, uh, not a legitimate policy and overturned it, but you know it'll be in the courts for the time being. Obviously, uh, the more America sells overseas, you reduce the trade deficit, and you uh, generate jobs and, and dollars for the United States. Uh, I assume that you're, that's kind of the thing, one of the things you'd be on board with, but uh, can you dig, dig into some of the specific ways that you think America can write its budgetary uh, ship, uh, trade as well, and also, you know, it doesn't have to be energy, it could be anything, but uh, uh, if you would talk about LNG as an issue, though. You're... <laughs> Because you admitted you don't know who Steve Jones is, you don't know that one of my significant commitments has been to gas production worldwide. And the comment I made earlier about reverting to an agrarian society, that's firsthand experience. The last two years I was traveling abroad, my wife reluctantly joined me in Senegal, and our goal there was to take a sub-Saharan a country that was basically growing mangoes and fishing and put them into an industrial state. The way that we did that is it was in a million acre onshore concession 
and we located gas. Now, gas in a country takes them from being an agrarian society and opens up the opportunity. In case of Senegal, where I was, they could start producing aluminum. Uh, they could uh, open up a fertilizer plant and on and on and on. Here in the United States, we are we have an excess of riches, which makes us very callous to those riches. New Mexico, probably worse. We have such God-given resources available to us that we become altruistic about them. This new Green Deal is a crazily incited thing to say that he, we here in the United States, by driving electric vehicles, is going to somehow counterbalance the fact that China is polluting uh, substantially with soft coal or that India has no regard at all for emissions, et cetera, et cetera. Unless we put a dome over the United States, we are a part of the world. So if you really, really want to have a new Green New Deal, then make sure that Brazil's forests are replenished. Make sure China stops burning coal. Go over to India and stop their emission. But here in the United States, gas is one of our great resources. And we should not snub our nose, as Biden has, at that resource. It is such a tremendous benefit to everyone we deal with, that we can compress and cool. I've studied this technology for 20 years. It has been difficult because there was technology involved in how do we do that. Yes, we all saw the flares coming up of oil-producing wells and said, you know, lighting up the sky is one way of using the gas, but isn't there a better way? Yes, there is. And that is through piping it over to Houston, New Orleans, to various co uh, coastal towns, Corpus Christi, and compressing it at very high pressures, cold temperatures, and sending it over to people who are paying far less for that natural gas that they're getting compressed than they would pay for oil. It is also eliminating it as a po the possibility of using energy, as Russia has many times, as the Middle East have many times, as a political tool to force energy-poor countries into submission. Well, we went through that with the oil embargo, the Arab oil embargo, and now Europe is suffering the same consequence. So it is the most ridiculous thing for the president of the United States to ever do to take that resource, which, yes, we made money off of it, but more importantly, it was a godsend to a Europe that was starved of energy because of Putin's invasion of the Ukraine. Yeah, and I'll uh, just remind you and uh, our viewers and listeners that uh, in February of 2021, uh, Melanie Stansbury said that uh, displaced energy workers at the uh, coal-fired power plant, the San Juan generating station up in the Four Corners, uh, so uh, Navajo or Diné, should uh, sell your art or wool uh, instead of working those high-paid jobs at the coal-fired power plant. So uh, her, her own energy policy is uh, nothing short of appalling in terms of what it would do to uh, or has done uh, to those Navajo workers in New Mexico. So... Um, we have got to wrap this up, but I want to give you a chance to uh, uh, make your pitch, uh, share any uh, websites or any information about what your uh, goals are right now in this campaign. Obviously, we've gotten the primaries out of the way. Chaos has ensued against in Washington, but uh, hopefully we'll get focused on not just the presidential side of things, but congressional races and whatnot uh, here in the next few months of this campaign. But uh, share anything you would like. If you want to win vain for a congressperson, vote Stansbury. If you want someone who has a career in problem solving and literally under many different economic scenarios around the world, then you go to my website. That's Steve Jones the number four, nm.com. And oh, by the way, if while you're there reading the qualifications, which were substantial, and the achievements, there's a little donate button that if you click on that, you'd be doing a, me a great favor. I would appreciate all sizes of contributions. I would like to also comment that the Rio Grande Foundation, 
could use the similar clip. Uh, they have a donation well, button as well. Thank you so much. Yes, um, uh, that is an accurate statement. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.